feel so much better in the light. There's no reason you should be defeated. God will fight your battles with his might. So walk away from darkness, leave behind defeat. In Jesus there is happiness complete. Our God specializes in good things, things that you and I the body and spirit. All you have to do is just believe. Praise the Lord. What a glorious day the Lord has given us to worship him in and to learn how to walk in his word and his will. I'm Dr. Stephanie, your host, along with my co-host, Pastor Karen Weitzman, and together we welcome you to Living the Word. Did you come expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God. So get that expectation level elevated. And when you come expecting to receive, you're going to gain wisdom, insight, and understanding and make a better revelatory connection with your heart and mind. So open your hearts and prepare to receive. You know, Pastor Karen and I will be bringing you understanding of and practical application of God's Word to your life. We will be teaching you how to apply the, inst uh, the instructions that we were given over 2,000 years ago that we have trouble applying to today. And we'll discuss the commandments, statutes, and ordinances given to us in our blood covenant, how to operate in them in our daily life, and we will not only be imparting God's wisdom, we'll also be giving you some insights into our God and His character to help you grow in Christ. Stay with us as we learn how to walk in the Word successfully and living the Word. Good morning, Pastor Karen. <laughs> Good morning, Pastor Stephanie. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. <clears throat> I've um, had a... I think I shared with you last time that I had one of my little squirrels that had drowned in the swimming pool and I was very distraught. Yes. Uh, and trying to work my way through it, which was... I didn't... It was fine. But... Um, the Lord spoke to my heart, and I, I think I explained that I had this overwhelming urge to pray. Maybe I didn't uh, tell you. Anyway, a couple, maybe it was afterwards. Anyway, I had an overwhelming urge to pray over that swimming pool and uh, secure it and protect, protect it. Protect it. Mm -hmm. And I have. And since then, we normally would have like a little mouse or a lizard or something, you know, or bugs, you know, that go in the swimming pool. All we've had is leaves. <laughs> I yeah, forgot to I course, forgot to right? put the the leaves in the protection. <laughs> My husband said I wish you had even had one leaf. Off, no, right? <laughs> yeah, I have had leaves, but nothing else. <laughs> oh, you just got leaves. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Praise God. But Art said you should have put the leaves under there so my job wouldn't be so hard because he's the pool cleaner up the thingy, you know. Okay. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry, honey, I forgot, and I still haven't remembered to do it. But we see that we have one of these little mama squirrels is pretty rotund. I think she's about to give birth again, so we should have some little guys on the horizon again. But um, Good. we're down to let's see, two. Three, four squirrels out of nine is what we have left. So the coyotes have been having a dinner on us, and I don't like it, but I hear them. And it's well, a, you know, what can you do to protect them? You know, you have to keep them in the wild, and, yeah. and there's well, nothing you can, nothing anymore that you could do. No, and, you know, we have, uh, a long time ago when we first moved in here, we, we buried chicken wire under the fence so that they couldn't dig through people. But they dig through it. You know, it's it's... One of those situations. Yeah, they're wonderful diggers. That's, yeah, I they are. Talked, I talked last time how I love to see them get a nut or get whatever they <laughs> yeah. get and bury it because it's so cute to watch them. It is. And, of course, uh, all of the – we planted a whole triangle out in the front yard of, of uh, uh, um, star jasmine because I want the fragrance. And they went out and ate every last one of them. Wow. <laughs> uh, one of them I've, I've managed to keep in a pot and watch to see if it's going to come back. We haven't dug them up. We just keep watering. Mm -hmm. And right now it's taken like three weeks, but now I've got little tiny leaves coming back on it. So I said, well, we'll just keep watering these because they're not leaving. Them. They're not touching them as long as they're just the stem. But um, I had this marvelous, gigantic uh, hen and chickens, you know, but just the, just the hen was huge and gorgeous. And it was right along the walkway, and I admired it so. I walked out the other day, and it looked like an artichoke had been eaten. You know how they take the petals off, and now it's down to the heart, where you're just going to have to take all the foof out of there to eat the heart. <laughs> That's what it looked like. And I went, who's been eating my hen and chick? Oh. And here I see they've pulled up by the root, too, of the little chicks, and they've moved those over. And I picked them up today and replanted them. <laughs> I was like, you guys, 
stop it. <laughs> I mean, you love them, but they really can destroy a They're lot. They're very of destructive. That you plant, yeah. We have uh, on our on our retaining wall. We have uh, I. Uh, asparagus fern that just grows rampant. We have to cut it back all the time. So I haven't. They have been mowing that and it's marvelous. They've kept it all cut back for me. They have trimmed the ivy and the ice plant along the swimming pool scalloped edge, you know, so that I don't have to go over there and cut that off. It's amazing. But they did eat my roses and they ate the leaves off my roses. So I have a few stems that are like up at the very tippy top. We had to take the apricot tree out. They ate it all. Wow. They ate all of it. It was just a mess, that poor thing. So it wasn't giving us any fruit, and we've had it for three years. So it blo blossoms and gives us hope every year and won't give us a thing. <laughs> so well, we, just, we got rid of it. Have you prayed over that tree? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. we, we opted to take it out. We dug it out, and then we are putting another extension of the patio there. We'd been going to do it and if that didn't live. And it was living, but I can't. It just looks like, like something dead. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't, it started to come back the first time that they stripped it. And then after that, uh, they've just cleaned it out to the point where it looks like a dead tree. And I think that it didn't have much hope. So we took it out and now we're much happier because we're working on that patio thing. Well, Art is. I'm happy because he's doing it. <laughs> what are you expanding the patio? Yeah. Or? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. it's, That's nice. Uh, That's nice. It's always been one that there was a step up there. The one that they poured the uh, uh, apron for the swimming pool, they made a curve and did some design with it. and But it made a step down. And we have decided that we've always wanted to raise it up and finish it. It was like, mm -hmm. here's this grass. We had a clothesline there once, and then we had grass that didn't live. Um, everything we put there is just a mess all the time. So we said, patio, put the sw the umbrella table there, and we'll be. <laughs> you know, so we're extending Good. it. Yeah. Well, it's nice to live outside. Um, well, it is. And, during spring and summer, and, and the pool you yeah. know, affords you the ability to do that. Yeah. Well, I, I have to be honest, because during the summertime, <clears throat> and the spring. I get through with the program and if I've got five minutes I jump out of this office and run outside just so I can get fresh air, you know. Me too. I um, do the just, same thing. I run outside. I just have I'm, got I'm, to be out. I'm like Pastor Stephanie. I'm on the computer <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah. And uh, it's always nice to go out in the sunshine or whatever the weather might be and I just love being Mm -hmm. you know, going out for a few minutes, so I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's just it's something I absolutely, my soul cries out for it. <laughs> I feel like a cornflake. Yeah. yeah, me too. Well, friends, right now, take a second to assemble a small piece of bread or cracker, or a small bite of food, and a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice. It can be water. Set it aside. Set them all aside, because later on we're going to pray over those items, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. But let's begin right now by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us. Pastor Karen, will you open us in prayer? Yes. Everybody, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise in your holy name. You are worthy, Lord, to be honored, praised, worshipped, and adored. And we hope that every broadcast brings uh, adoration to you, Lord, because how excellent is thy name in all the world. Father, we, we pray that you would allow the Logos word uh, to go forward today, followed by your revelation from the Holy Spirit. We welcome the Holy Spirit always in and, and know, Lord, that it's the revelatory word that causes us to be able to change and to be able to go forth uh, and to be motivated into what you wish for us to do in life. Father, we uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight today, Lord Jesus. And I just thank you for the greater interpretation and the greater revelation that we'll receive from the topic of binding and loosing. Father, we give you all praise. We give you all worship and glory. We thank you for those people that who regularly attend our Living the Word series, Lord. And we thank you for um, our, the sunny days that we're receiving. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, as we prepare for God's word, we know that we need to enter more deeply into the throne room. So open your hearts and minds expecting to receive as we soak in worship.
Father, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be wholly acceptable to you. And may Pastor Karen's and my words be your words and your words be ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now today we're going to continue our journey through Stronghold Land as we learn about binding and loosing. Last time we met during our discussion of binding the strongman, we touched on binding and loosing and decided it was a topic we really needed to deeply investigate. One that we actually have had little to no understanding of and the most of which has been a distorted misconception of what it truly is. We're going to be <clears throat> taking this slowly and by spoonful so that we get proper biblical understanding of what it is to bind and loose. Yeah, and, and like anything else, uh, Pastor Stephanie, you know, when you read when you read the Word of God and um, you read it contextually, you read it theologically, yeah. you know, you read it, what's, what's the practical implication? And then there's the revelatory knowledge. That's right. So binding and loosing is no different than anything else. So I think probably today we'll be going over it contextually, how it is in context, mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, how, how they use binding and loosing in the Old Testament. That's and right. Probably are still continuing to do that today. Mm -hmm. And con and we'll talk about also the revelation knowledge that the Holy Spirit has given us about this. Amen. So, That's so true. Yeah, we're going to begin by looking into, or I will, but on my part, I'm going to begin by looking into and discussing the popular Pentecostal charismatic practice of binding and loosing. Certain attitudes or dispositions, demonic spirits, and sometimes even angels. Now, despite the widespread use of these terms and the approach to dealing with the supernatural that they represent, teachings like these do provide opportunities for pastors and their people to exercise discernment and sound actually hermeneutical practices to determine the correct interpretation of the passages used to teach the practice of binding and loosing. Now, we need to address the issue of binding and loosing for several reasons. First, this widespread practice reflects the need for solid biblical interpretation, as you're saying. And uh, people often assume the biblical support uh, for this issue rather than actually searching it out of the scriptures for truth. <clears throat> I mean, they take the word of, uh, of how the pastor uses it in a sentence, you know what I mean, as mm -hmm. to be the gospel instead of looking for it. Because it's not that you're trying to prove that the pastor is wrong. It's that you need to see it for yourself to get the revelation, like you were talking about, the revelatory experience of it. The Pentecostal movement has always espoused the belief that Scripture alone is the foundation for all matters of faith and practice. Now, therefore, those who take the Bible seriously, have a, uh, they have to discipline themselves to hold all their beliefs and practices to the scrutiny of the Scriptures. In other words, what we're going to do is we're going to take what we understand and go back to the Scriptures and verify it. And if it doesn't hold water, we throw it out. You know, we, That way we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We keep the baby and just throw the dirty bathwater out. And actually, what you're saying there is uh, one, of the, one of the meanings of binding and Lucy. Do we discern that we uh, permit it to be something that we want to use in our doctrine or something that we want to use in our church? Uh -huh. Do we permit it or do we forbid it? That's um, right. You know, yeah. so what you're talking about is you're talking about binding and loosing it That's right, right now. Now, second, we need to see popular theological issues as ways to engage scripture and develop our abilities in biblical uh, interpretation and application. So we can't be lax in the spiritual discipline of regular Bible study. Third, God calls us to desire to know and delight to do His will. Romans 12, verse 1, Ephesians 5, 10, and 17, and Colossians 1, 9 through 10. So the Word of God has to pervade every thought, word, and action of those who wish to please God and know and do His will. The final reason for serious consideration of this issue is concern for the spiritual health of individual Christians and the body of Christ. Teachings that don't have solid biblical support often wrongly influence believers and lead to false doctrine and practices. So uh, those, those types of things will do harm to the spiritual health of believers and the church, the body of Christ. With these thoughts in mind, let's examine this popular teaching. Let's begin by stating the problem. In terms of frequency, the modern use of the term, terms binding and loosing is completely out of sync with the frequency of their usage in the New Testament. Most Christians are surprised to learn that the verbs bind and loose only appear together twice. Both are in Matthew 16 verse 19 and Matthew 18 verse 18. Because the same Greek word for bind used in these verses, deo, also appears in Matthew 12 verse 29 and look also at Mark 3 verse 27. Because so many Pentecostals and Charismatics have concluded that all three of these passages refer to the believer's authority to bind rebellious and demonic spirits. 
What appears to be a simple, straightforward conclusion, however, is riddled with contextual, theological, and practical difficulties. I told you I did some digging. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so despite the popular interpretation that Jesus' words, which are, or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? Matthew 29, 12, verse 29, when he compared with Mark 3, 27, and this is it, but no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. So how can they prescribe a sequence for exorcism? Evidence elsewhere in the New Testament makes this unlikely. For example, even though the gospel writers recorded multiple confrontations between Jesus and demonic spirits, there is no instance in the written record in which Jesus bound a demon before he cast it out. Furthermore, this kind of action in, re in relationship to binding demons isn't found in the book of Acts, the epistles, or the book of Revelation. In comparison to the elaborate exorcistic formulas of contemporary Jews and pagans, the words and actions of Jesus and his earliest followers are terse, succinct, and to the point. Come out. That's what he mm -hmm. said. Come out. Mm -hmm. If Jesus was anything, he was consistent. If his first century followers were anything, they were obedient to his teachings. He was their rabbi. If Jesus had intended to prove a, a description for the proper sequence of events for a successful exorcism in Matthew 12, verse 29, he would have followed his own formula when exercising demons. Amen? So, his New Testament dis disciples would have to follow it as well. And that's us. We need to follow his example, his interpretation. So, following the interpretive principles of Scripture interpret scripture, right? Scripture, inter Bible, Bible interprets Bible. And examining scripture as a whole requires that we understand Matthew 12, verse 29, and Mark 3, verse 27, not as a command, but rather as an analogy. An illustrative technique that Jesus used regularly in all four Gospels. Satan is not a man, but, a si but similar to a rich man who must be subdued before a thief can rob his home. Satan must be disarmed before the kingdom of God can advance. Our evidence is Matthew 12, verse 28. Now, second, the context of Matthew 16, verse 19, and Matthew, 16, Matthew 18, verse 18, has nothing to do with exorcism. And it's been used erroneously, all these many multitudes of, you know, eons, in that context, and it's a misconception. In chapter 16, Jesus was talking about building the church. Verse 18, the keys he gave were unlocking the kingdom of heaven. Verse 19, not for the unlocking or binding of the dominion of darkness. In Matthew 18, binding and loosing doesn't take place in context of exorcism, but in administering church discipline. The leaders of the church have the responsibility to determine who is allowed to remain within the new covenant community and under what conditions. Well, it, that, that mm -hmm. refers to like the Greek word ecclesia. Yeah. which was church, which was, uh, Ecclesia in the Greek was an assembly of people assigned to govern the affairs of a city, state, or nation, or uh -huh. a body of people that would legislate spiritually um, what kingdom government was supposed to be. So in that sense, binding and loosing would refer to the authority, here the authority uh -huh. that Jesus would give his church members or his disciples or whoever was governing in his church to be able to go forth and permit, uh, loosen what they wanted and bind out, forbid what they didn't want. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because uh, the, the Greek word ecclesia is used in that context. And right. so we look at that as the leadership of the church, like you say, who are, who are the governing bodies, who have been given the privilege of like the board of directors and the, the pastor and that kind of thing and the lay preachers. So if this is the case in Matthew 18 and the language binding and loosing is identical to the language of Matthew 16, then the context of these two passages are probably related somewhat. Now, in discussing the relationship between these two passages, it's important to consider the hermeneutical pr principle, Scripture interprets Scripture. So this principle requires that the unclear or disputed passage to be interpreted on the basis of the clear passage, since hermeneutics is the science of interpretation, especially of the scriptures and the history of hermeneutics in all times, show that there is only one step from the literal to the allegorical. And I know that that's deep, you guys, but, you know, look it up.
So <laughs> there's sometimes you just got to step over the bridge and jump off the cliff. In this instance, Matthew 18, 18 functions as the clear and undisputed passage. Third, when people incorrectly interpret and apply Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, theological and practical problems will inevitably arise. Okay. For example, as we see in Jewish and Christian literature, and this is your bailiwick, so you're, you know, I may be wrong and you can, you know, knock me down and, and uh, verbally <laughs> over this, if that's the case. But as we see in Jewish and Christian literature outside the Bible, nowhere in scripture does God give believers the task of binding Satan or demons. Is that right? Not, not literally. No. Yeah. Okay. I, he doesn't say that, but I do believe Matthew 16, 16 through 18 does say, he says the gates of hell will not overpower my church. So he's telling us uh, that his kingdom, that we can't allow the gates of hell to overpower his church. I mean, I think if we want to go through Matthew 16, 16 through 18, I think that that would be something that would give a lot of insight into our listeners right now. If, if you want, if you want to go through it, I've got it here Okay. where he's talking to Peter. He uh -huh. says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah and the son of the living God. And he says, then he blesses Simon Barjona or Peter. He says, blessed are you because flesh and blood, in other words, you know, uh, you didn't uh, learn this, did not reveal this to you. But my father in heaven, it came supernaturally. Mm -hmm. And I and I say to you, I don't know if he renamed him, sir. He renamed him at that very point. He when says, he I rock. say, mm -hmm. you are Peter. Yeah. And on this rock, Peter meaning rock, rock. Or Petra Petra. meaning rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not, will not overpower it. That whole scripture is revelatory in that Jesus is in their midst. He realizes it. He heard it from God. The kingdom was able to come through to the earth. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in the heaven. It was the revelation that Peter had from the Father. He was listening to the Father. And he said, uh, I say to you, I will build my church on, on, this, on this rock. So he had the, all the disciples had the revelation of who Jesus was. And now he says he turns it around like he turns so many things around and says to us, build this church for those who have the same revelation of who I am of who I am and who will surrender their lives to my lordship. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and build this church. He doesn't say, and then he goes on after that and says, I give you the keys, the keys meaning opening the doors and the gates, the, the authority, I give you authority and the, and now heaven can come to earth. Mm -hmm. so and read, whatever read you that want on earth will be bound in yeah, heaven. Read the scripture about the keys. On earth will be loosed in heaven. I know, Karen. Will you do me a favor? Read the because I don't have it in front of me. Read the scripture about the keys. Okay, I'm just I was reciting that. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, comes, it comes right after yeah. that. I, I was reading Matthew 16. 16 well, I want to. It I, comes right after. I want to make sure that people understand that it is not the keys to the kingdom. It's the keys of the kingdom. We yeah. are already in the kingdom as born again believers. We have the keys of the kingdom. We can open all the doors, and therefore the gates of hell will not prevail against us, right. the church, the, the rock, in other words, because we're little rocks. <laughs> yeah, you but know, I think the keys the are, it's important that we see that he says, you know, the, the gates of hell are not going to prevail over me mm -hmm. because I'm giving you, because it goes on, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, um, but what I'm, uh, my point in first say, stating this in the first place was that I'm talking about in Jewish and Christian literature outside the Bible, mm -hmm. you know, um, nowhere actually in the scriptures does God give the believers the task of binding Satan or demons. We're not given that task. Right. It's already been taken care of. Instead, God and his angelic intermediaries alone handle that activity. And evidence for that is found in Revelation verse chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Now, in recent times, the interpretation... Yeah, and of, if we were mm -hmm. able to bind... Let me ask. That's okay. If sure. we were able to bind Satan, yeah. uh, we'd already be in the millennium. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We're, see, that's what these, I was saying. That we have some problems here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so 
In That's right. What, what you're saying is correct. Yeah. In recent times, the interpretation of loosing has sometimes made reference to a believer's prerogative to allow demonic forces to exercise a certain amount of freedom. You know, and more often, however, loosing is applied to releasing a spirit of revival or intercession. In extreme instances, the spirit of Elijah or some other biblical figure is loosed. With respect to the first three interpretations, it's more appropriate to attribute such in, uh, initiatives or goings on to the work of the Holy Spirit rather than to the dictates of a man. Now, regarding the last interpretation, the language and the concept it represents border on necromancy, which is interaction involving the dead. All right, and are spiritually unhealthy and, and biblically inappropriate. Uh, Leviticus 19, verse 26, and Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 11 are, are scriptures for that. Interaction involving departed saints is within the purview of God alone. And fourth, in many circles, it's been in vogue to practice the binding of certain attitudes or personal attributes that are labeled spirits. I know people are going to get going to identify with this because it's what we hear all the time. And as a result of that interpretation, parents are often encouraged to bind the spirit of rebellion in their unruly children. Similarly, we often hear well-meaning people bind the spirit of unbelief over a person or a group. Now, as spiritual as this language sounds, my friends, it belies an unbiblical frame of reference. It's not in the Bible. It's kind of like cleanliness is next to godliness. It's not in the Bible. But it sounds good, you know. God created people as free moral agents. He gives us the capacity and responsibility to choose. God will not answer a prayer that requires him to violate this aspect of human nature. He doesn't step and trot all over us. Uh, uh, he, he intentionally created that, that uh, uh, um, requirement or what I want to call it, a statute, and he will not violate it. So when we pray like this, we're placing ourselves outside of the scriptures that are supposed to function as our only rule for faith and practice. Once departure from the parameters of Scripture occurs, what happens is further depart departures become more likely, like the belief and practice of commanding angels that some Christians have embraced. So, what is the proper interpretation and application then? Now that we've discussed what Matthew 16, 19 and Matthew 18, 18 don't mean, <laughs> we need to discuss what they do mean. First, to understand the binding and loosing terminology in Matthew 16, verse 19, we must begin with Matthew 18, verse 18. When the principle of intermediate literary context is employed, the meaning of this passage becomes clear because it contains numerous contextual indi indicators. Here we go. The elements of a brother who sins, verse 15, reprove him, verse 15, witnesses, verse 16, church, verse 17, and excommunication, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer, verse 17. Leave no doubt that the passage is not about exorcism, but excommunication. excommunication. Yeah. So in this context, verse 18 occurs. Whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatever, I put the word in there, I'm sorry. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. When Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20 is taken as a whole, Jesus was authorizing church leaders to follow a specific process to preserve the purity and witness of the church, of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. They are deputized to protect the reputation of God and his church, his body, and if need be, dismiss members who blatantly persist in sinful lifestyles. Their decisions are authoritative, binding, and final. And that's what you're talking about, the authority. Uh, so, lest we take the trans traditional translation of these words to the extreme, we need to note that this text does not grant unbridled human influence on the decrees of God. Authoritative Greek reference grammars note this, that we need to render verse 18 this way. Whatever you shall bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. Right, because... Peter was listening to his father, mm -hmm. and and that's how he got his revelation. It all he had it, you know, it already had been it had set, already I guess, been set up. That's right. Yeah. So Christian leaders are supposed to reflect the whole will of God in their decision making, not generate it. All right, they just reflect it, as with many other scripture passages. This one teaches us as His servants to do His will rather than requiring that He do our will. Evidence is as follows: Matthew six verse ten. Matthew 7, verse 21, Matthew 26, verse 39, Romans 12, verse 1, Ephesians 5, verse 10 and 17, and Colossians 1, 9 through 10. The two final verses of this passage provide further evidence of the judicial 
judicial versus exorcistic nature of the passage. Listen to how it goes. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20. Usually these verses have been used to guarantee answers to prayer requests offered by two or three believers who are in agreement with one another. But the words, again I say, clearly fuse this teaching with the previous instruction. In other words, Jesus was reiterating the same truth he communicated in verse 18. The agree about anything that they may ask in verse 19 has limits defined by the context in which the phrase occurs. Because the broader context concerns church discipline, it's likely then that Jesus meant that God is willing to answer prayers for strength, wisdom, insight, courage, and impartiality for the confronters or discipliners and for conviction, contriteness, responsiveness, repentance, and forgiveness for the sinner. The guarantee of God's presence among the two or three gathered together in his name in verse 20 fits perfectly in the judicial disciplinary context. The two or three mentioned are not arbitrary numbers. They refer to the witnesses whom the judge co could call forward to establish the sinful words. Remember, you go by yourself and, and confront your brother. Then if they, he doesn't respond, respond in kind, take two. two now, yeah. And then go, you know, three, and then by their eyewitness testimony. Evidence, Deuteronomy 17, verses 6, thing, 6 through 7. Deuteronomy 19, verses 15 through 21. And 1 Timothy 5, 19. So the two or three Jesus mentions in Matthew 18, verse 20, no doubt refer to the witnesses in verse 16. These words carry a promise and a warning. The promise is God's guarantee that no leaders or witnesses will have to go through this difficult experience alone or in their own strength. They will experience God's presence, his authorization, and his empowerment despite the strain of the situation. The warning, however, is seen in the fact that none, none less than God oversees the whole process. His earthly representatives must remember his personal holiness, righteousness, justice, and impartiality when they pass judgment. I mean, it's an awful thing when you think of it, because we're both pastors, that we have to sit in this position of judgment. We have to make sure that what we're doing is absolutely not flesh and is totally God. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very difficult, and their decisions have to reflect the heavenly decree. So encouragement and challenge such as this it was common in the early centuries. We can see this in the passage from the rabbinic literature that provides further biblical foundation. The judges should know whom they judge and in whose presence they judge and who it is who judges them. And the witnesses should know about whom they give testimony and in the presence of whom they give testimony and with whom they give testimony and who it is who is a witness with them since it is said then both the men who shall have the dispute shall stand before the Lord. Deuteronomy 19, verse 17. And it is said, God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. Psalm 82, verse 1. Second, after we establish that the binding and loosing Jesus commanded in Matthew 18, verse 18, concerns church discipline, we can move to Matthew 16, verse 19. Here, the context is less obvious, but the unusual Yet overlapping language supplies ample reason to suspect that the context is similar to that of Matthew 18.18. 18. The fact that the verbs bind and loose appear in both passages and nowhere else in Scripture suggests that the contexts are related. Now, other criteria will need to be satisfied, however, before we can reach a conclusion. When we look at the immediate literary context indicators, although possibly less obvious, they suggest similarity of context with Matthew 18. For example, in Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus speaks of building his church. Verse 19 introduces the metaphor of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Um, because of the, the generative, genival, gen, genitival clarifying phrase, <laughs> I'll get it out in a minute, of the kingdom of heaven, all right, the keys must refer to authority to determine admittance and non-admittance into the fellowship of the church. So it's at this point in the verse that the phrase in question appears, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, Matthew 16, 19. 
The grammatical construction here is the same as that in Matthew 18.18. 18. Therefore, as in Matthew 18.18, 18, we can more accurately translate it this way. Whatever you shall bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven, and whatever you have loosed on earth shall already have been loosed in heaven. So in this context and of the text, uh, Jesus commanded all church leadership to reflect the will of God and not their own will with respect to whom they should receive as a member in good standing of the New Covenant community. Yeah, and in order for the kingdom of God on earth uh -huh. to synchronize with the kingdom of God in heaven, uh -huh. we need to be able to see or discern what the Father is doing so that we can, you know, to bring forth what he wants to be Spot bring on. forth. That's right, spot on. Absolutely. So, in addition to the fact of Matthew 16, 19 and Matthew 18, 18, that they share the same terminology and context, uh, literature relevant to this discussion is found outside the Bible, and it supports in, in interpreting these texts in the manner that I've just explained it. Okay, so you have to go outside, take the scriptures, go through the Bible, and, and qualify them and quantify them, and then you will have to go to commentaries because you have to look at what other people like you have research to find how they've interpreted so that you can see that you're not alone in what you've interpreted. <laughs> so. Right, and then but then how do you explain all the also uh, different denominations that have been created from people who it's taking have a, discerned okay have discerned. Go ahead. Well, most mm -hmm. you'll find that most of them will line up together regarding uh, regardless what their denominated uh, uh, affiliation mm -hmm. is. They'll line up and it's kind of like that sounded good to me and I like that so that's how I'm going to interpret it too you know what I mean and so they never go back and do the the full groundwork like you and I are to to dig down and find out what it truly means because the truth will set you free so how many times have we and I'm saying this collectively as a whole as the body of Christ have we as the body of Christ some of us maybe get it or don't you know but the ones of us who think we got it have used this inappropriately you know we do it all the time because somebody taught us that from the pulpit and they got it wrong and that's how it goes like a stone that gathers moss as it rolls down the hill so it doesn't matter what their um, their denomination is, but if it is a denominational thing, it's somebody from that denomination, from the higher up, the leadership that got it wrong and now passed it on to everybody that took their uh, denomination and espoused it. You know what I mean? So, and even though well, there are times when it doesn't make sense, it's a means of giving an authority from yeah. heaven. Yeah, it's a means. The key. It's a mean um, means of getting authority. Then I guess it can be open to. Uh, people getting it wrong. I don't know. Well, if, uh, if he the, gave people authority, then they, you know, what I'm saying is that could have opened the door for people to say, oh, I have authority. So, well, gonna... keep in mind, though, that the only people that have authority are the born again believers individually. The keys of the kingdom belong to me okay. individually, belong to you individually. And God says in, in his word, in essence, what he's saying, I'm just going to paraphrase it, is that then dig out what it really means. And understand, because if we read the Bible, and we, you and I have gone through this with our students and stuff, when we read the Bible, we have to look at it in context of what has been written and what is being said. Who is he speaking to? We read above the scripture and below the scripture to finally find out what that means. And what's happened here over the years and over the eons and whoever many knows how many years <laughs> as this has happened, people have taken that scripture about binding and loosing and pulled it out of context and popped it over here somewhere and applied it to something that they thought that it sounded good. It worked for them because they had command over the spirits because they had the keys of the kingdom, which is not the case. It's not the case at all. Okay. It takes it and makes us rebellion in, in, in rebellion because we are rebelliously taking it upon ourselves to put words in God's mouth. See, and we can't do that. Not legally. So, um, hey, when I, <laughs> I read this and I, I studied this out, I really dug out. I spent a wee hours of the morning and many, many nights between the last week and here uh, yeah. working on mm -hmm. this. 
And I prayed over this and I said, Lord, give me the revelation. I have to be able to see this the way it truly is. And he'd give me another scripture. And I go back through the scriptures and all the ones that I didn't read, but gave you guys the, as the evidence, I mm -hmm. looked those up, but I, I could have spent my life on those, you know, and, and missed the point altogether and, and tried to s summarize it sort of, we get, get something out of it. And I said, you know well, what? I've been I guilty. See, I had I to see repent. A connection. There are a few verses, which I may be premature here. And there are a few verses that connected to uh, binding and loosing to uh, casting out demons is um, Matthew 12, 28 through 29 says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon me or upon you? Or how can I enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless I first bind the strong man? There's the word bind. Unless I first bind the strong man, and then he will be able to plunder his house. That's so, not, and when you bind, uh, it doesn't say bind the spirit. It says if you cast out demons, the demonic spirit or whatever, uh, uh, by the spirit. So what spirit is that? It's, okay, not, well, it's not binding you know, and loosing. When we were talking about strongholds, we know that we can create in our minds patterns of thought. Uh -huh. That's the stronghold. Patterns of thought that don't align up with God's word. Uh -huh. And then behind those patterns of thoughts comes the enemy, comes the uh -huh. strong man. Uh -huh. So we have and to binds be able, you. Huh? He binds you. And binds me. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't say to unbind you by casting him out, uh, uh, binding him. What it says is to do that, but read it again. Okay. Um, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. Stop. That's where I want to go. Right there it says it all. Right there who's it the, says it all. Who's yeah. the Spirit of God? Christ. We use the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's how you cast out demons. It has nothing to do with binding Satan. It doesn't have anything to do with binding Satan. But it does have to do with binding the strong man. All right. We, I think I covered that at the beginning, but let me go back. Let me see if okay, I can go back. No, no, that's okay. I, I, I maybe was, it was deep, and I may have div dived off the board and not d done a good job of explaining it. Let me go back up here. Um, 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 um. Uh, what scripture is that? Matthew 12, 28 12. through 29, okay. which I think you didn't gonna... mention. You, man, you mentioned Matthew 16, 16 through 18, and Matthew 18, 18. Yeah, that's where I was working on that particular thing. I mentioned it earlier, but I don't know if we're if I've covered it or if I'm just going to do it next week, but it's okay. I'll go back and look. Um, and let me go back up here, 12, 29. I remember there's 12, 28. Satan must be disarmed before the kingdom of God can advance. Our evidence is Matthew 12, 28. All right, let me come backwards. <laughs> here we are. All yeah, right. 1228. That's what we just read. All right, so here we go. If Jesus intended to provide a description for the proper sequence of events for a successful exorcism, in Matthew 1229, he would have followed his own formula when exorcising demons. That is not about exorcising demons. The New Testament disciples would have followed that same uh, exorcistic uh, uh, formula. Okay. Scripture interprets Scripture, and examining Scripture as a whole requires that we understand Matthew 12, 29 and Mark 3, 27, because they're both in, uh, not as a command, but rather as an analogy, all right? Mm -hmm. So, an illustrative technique that Jesus used regularly for all the Gospels, all four in all four uh, accounts of the Gospel. Satan is not a man, but similar to a rich man who must be subdued before a thief can rob his home. He's using it as a, a as an analogy. Satan must be disarmed before the kingdom of God can advance. Our evidence, Matthew 12, 28. Second, the context of Matthew 16, 19, and Matthew, and I went down into the other part, had nothing to do with exorcism either. See, these scriptures, those four sets of scriptures are always misconstrued as exorcism, of spiritually exorcising the bad guy so that we have freedom. We already have the freedom because we have the keys of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. But that has to do with our leadership abilities and administrative attitudes of how we uh, run our our church, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. our our body of Christ, the the sheep that are 
in our pasture, you know, <laughs> under our employ, our flock, right. and right. how we take care of uh, issues and govern how it how we govern because we have to do it as the way God would do it, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're mm -hmm. saying is when we say the analogy of we follow the man or woman in this case, but follow the man who follows God, how he follows God, that's how we choose our pastor. And we see them as the under shepherd. If you're not a good under shepherd, you're misconstruing the, uh, uh, the scriptures and you're teaching your flock something that's not there. You've misconstrued the verbiage. So what we need to so do you're is saying go, that we have the authority to declare what God tells us. That's we, right. That's decree. right. We decree. We rule and reign here. But yeah. we are like the deputy sheriff. <laughs> you know, we have to wait till the sheriff tells us what to do and then we go out and do it. We're the mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so because the leaders of the church have the responsibility to determine who is allowed to remain within the New Covenant community. In other words, if somebody's blatantly uh, living in adultery and they're coming to church and everybody knows it and they've been counseled, you've taken them aside, you've counseled them, told them it's wrong and they need to stop that. Oh, well, we're engaged. That doesn't make any difference. This is not the way that you should be living your life, you know, blah, blah, blah. And according to the scriptures, this is what it says. So you're defiling the marriage bed by having this live-in situation together beforehand, blah, blah, blah. All right, mm -hmm. so you've taken it, taken up with them, and they, re, they just flat out won't change. And you've gone to them, and somebody else is a witness to it, so they've come with you, and now they're, they're, people are reporting to you. So mm -hmm. now as the pastor, it's your job to prayerfully go to the Lord and find out what his idea is. How would he have you handle it? He might have something in mind for this person that, that as a lesson that you have to initiate, you know, or something like that. We don't know because we are not God. We are just his, his tools, <laughs> the tools of his trade. Right. And, and yet he may say, all right, you followed the rules the way that I've given you. He's giving you these scriptures and we keep going through the excommunication thing. So we finally go and to the person and we say, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to leave the church because your lifestyle and the fact that you will not comply with God's will and his word dictates that you cannot be here amongst the rest of the community because you are morally poisoning the, the rest of the group. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to leave. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. And we don't like to do that because we'll sit around and justify and say, well, we can't do that because everybody deserves a chance. And God doesn't want me to kick them out. You know what? Yes, he does. Because that person, if you don't excommunicate him, will never line up. He will always bend the rules. And, and he's got to answer for that. Not only that, he is in bondage and the strong man has him tied up like the Lilliputians had Gulliver. Yeah. And you know? didn't Paul at one point send Satan after the, the person to so that his soul would be saved? Mm, yeah. In one area of the church? Mm-hmm. I forget which one. Um, I don't re have it off the top of my head, but yes, it's, I remember something like that. Um, and I'd have to research it to, re to refresh my memory to make sure that we have it correct. But um, anyway, that's why I say that it is not a, uh, the way that we're reading it, we have to look at that as an analogy. Remember, too, that um, Jesus used these references all the time because that was their culture. You know, mm -hmm. and we have to look at that um, as uh, we have to, and a lot of this has to do with, and you know this because you and I have talked about this many times and you do it too. We have to go in and delve into the culture, the way the people lived, what their lifestyle was like, how they understood things, and the fact that Jesus was new on the new kid on the block and he was just now, you know, that kind of thing. Looking at how they had accepted it because the Old Testament was written from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Then when we get into the New Testament, it's a whole new ball game, new covenant, you know. So now we have to flip over and do this just like they did <laughs> when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. Well, unfortunately, there is a lot of carryover. And it's misconception because what was then was a different story. Jesus wasn't here yet. They were under the grace of God. Then they were being judged by God because of their own volition. You see what I mean? So now we have a lot of issues here that have 
been picked up and put over here with judgment in this New Testament that it don't belong there. It's a misconception. And mm -hmm. so that's why we have to unravel this ball of wax. Um, so, um, where did we leave off? I went backwards and I have to look, <laughs> look for where in my thing. Just a second. Um, well, it's like if we look at the Old Testament, um, it's kind of interesting because the rabbis um, bound or loose, they forbid or permitted something on on the rules based on Torah. So it's kind of interesting to look at. If you like take the first commandment, thou shall not kill, then, uh, you know, are, are you talking about, well, what's going to happen in war? Thou shall not kill. How do we apply that in war? How do we apply that uh, in abortion? You know, how, how do we apply that in self-defense? If we have to, if somebody comes in and tries to rob something, we have a gun and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how are, so this is what, this is how the rabbis got into being, uh, uh, what's the word, Pharisees, because they had to make rules upon rules. That's right. Well, you know? and, and their decisions, though, even then, have to, uh, have to reflect that heavenly decree. They yeah. have to hear from God. And keep in mind, too, God. that they never did this willy-nilly, like one guy out of all of them, that this is the head rabbi, so he's the cheese. All these other rabbis got in there, and they discussed it, and they talked about the scriptures, and they weighed it out, and they prayed, and you know what I mean, before they made a decision of how to handle it. Right, um, even the Council of Nicaea. That's right. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. the New Testament that we have today, or the, the teachings that we have today, they, they were praying about it also. Mm -hmm. about what God was saying, and that's how we have our word. That's right. That's right. So I'm still looking. I have a lot of notes here that I have to, and they're all sc scattered it's over okay. the place. It's okay. Take your time. Um, uh, building a church, blah, 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 blah. All right. I think I'm getting close. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to go from here and we'll see. I may, I may be repeating myself. All right. So um, the verb couplet to bind and loose and to loose occurs often in the rabbinic literature that it appears that Jesus was employing terminology his culture would easily understand. That's where I left off. Okay. So here are three examples. All right. During the war of Vespasian, Vespasian early rabbi, earlier rabbis bound the garlands of the bridegrooms and playing of the bells. During the war of Kytus, they bound the garlands of the brides and that a man should teach his son Greek. In the last war, the Bar Kokhba revolt, I probably didn't pronounce it right. You did. Okay. They bound the bride to ride in a litter with her village, but our rabbis loosed the bride to ride in a litter within her village. All right. So if a man made a vow to abstain from milk, he is loosed with respect to whey. W-H-E-Y, whey. Rabbi Yossi yeah. binds it. If a man made, made a vow to abstain from meat, he's loosed with respect to broth in which it was cooked. But Rabbi Judah binds it. Okay. If a man made a vow to abstain from wine, he's loosed with respect to the cooked dish that has wine in it, with that taste in it. Mm -hmm. If a man vowed to abstain from vegetables, he's loosed with respect to gourds, but Rabbi Akva binds them. See, so they would do this, and it was it was amongst their own little congregations. Mm -hmm. And these passages from that's from rabbinic literature confirm that the terms bind and loose, when occurring together, refer to the authority, which is what you were saying at the beginning of the show, the authority those in leadership have to forbid, bind, and to permit loose certain practices or behaviors and that's and what I think that that's is. probably okay as long as you don't look at the other church and come into judgment about uh, mm -hmm. what they're doing and that's not right you know what I'm saying that's right that's right and as long as you don't accuse your brother of uh, what they're doing is not, not yeah. what God is telling them to do or telling you to do well, these passages don't concern binding or loosing demonic spirits, angelic spirits, or even people's attitudes. What then is the difference between Matthew 16, verse 19, and Matthew 18, verse 18? Based on the contextual data already discussed that we just already went through, it appears that chapter 16 refers to the authority of the church leadership to forbid or permit entry into the covenant community. Chapter 18, on the other hand, refers to the authority of the leadership to forbid or permit continued membership in the covenant community. 
While this may sound heavy-handed and judgmental to some, pastoral staffs and boards of deacons, elders function today in the same way when the churches are functioning in healthy biblical patterns. I mean, they're doing it, and it works. And the fourth step by which to ensure proper interpretation is to compare one's conclusions with a broad spectrum of scholarship on the passage in question, which is what I said. We go out and we get all these you know, commentaries and what everybody else says. But And what I did, I didn't go to commentaries so much as I went to uh, for the New Testament view as I did on the rabbinic because it comes from that. And it moves over into this. And it was taken out of context when it moved over into the New Covenant, you know. Mm -hmm. So this step shouldn't be dismissed lightly as bowing to the interpretations of the majority. But rather, serious students of the Bible has to employ this step as an additional safety net or as a system of checks and balances. So uh, oh, what I'm saying is, oh, praise the Lord, honey. Praise the Lord. Um, <laughs> startled. I was so, so wrecked me, walked in quietly and handed me a note. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> thought an angel was coming to get me. To Jack. I did that to my husband this morning. <laughs> he jumped about three feet. <laughs> okay, so this step is kind of like scientists repeating an experiment and obtaining the same results. Okay, that way we check out the rabbinic teachings and the stuff around us. So in this instance, it's significant that an overwhelming consensus of scholars, biblical scholars now, liberal and conservative, Catholic and Protestant, Christian and Jewish, have embraced the basic interpretation that I've just shared with you. We can each several uh, help reach. We can reach several helpful practical conclusions. That's a tongue twister from a careful study of binding and loosing. First, the scriptures are instructive, encouraging, and liberating when they are properly understood and applied. The opposite can also be true when we unintentionally misconstrue or intentionally twist the scriptures. Well-meaning people are often hurt and sometimes even brought into fear of spiritual bondage. Second, the time-tested hermeneutical principles of intermediate, of immediate, literally, immediate literary context, grammatical context, scripture interprets scripture, the whole of scripture and the safety net of a community of reputable scholars are really good tools for biblical interpretation. None of these approaches is beyond the reach of most people. When we faithfully employ these principles, they enable us to come closer to the intended meaning of scripture. But here's the thing that I'm going to say to y'all. When Pastor Karen and I have done our research, we've been researching and we're not through. We're going to go on with this next week because there's more. We're going to dig it out. And, and we're going to take the dirt out, look at it. We're going to take the misconstru misconstructions or constructions or whatever you want to call it. No, that's not even a word. And we're going to open them up and look at them so that we can cathartically be set free of misconstrued, twisted scripture. This is important uh, because if we don't, we will go on teaching all of you guys that are out there, there are pastors that listen to us. You got the same deal. I mean, you're going to go on, and if you don't change from what you're going to learn and understand from this, then you're going to continue to teach erroneously. But here's the other thing: don't take our word for it. Get in and study it. That's been the problem all these generations. Somebody said, and somebody took it for the gospel because they didn't research it themselves and they went forward with it. If you're not a Bible scholar, call us. We'll help you. You just need, uh, we'll teach you how to, to study the word, but you need to dig it out. Read the scriptures yourself so that you see it again and again. I'm going to tell you something because I had some misconceptions myself in what I believed was true about these, these things, this binding and loosing. I had a lot of uh, good things that were right knowledge, but I also had some things that weren't right. You know, and, and I fortunately, thank God, wasn't teaching it. But anyway, the point was, I would have. I would have. And and here's the thing. This time that I spent with the Lord, as tedious and, and uh, uh, overwhelming sometimes as it was, because I was just overwhelmed in the hour of the day of what time I was doing it. But I was just, it was on, I was like, I was on fire. I was an obsessed person. You, I thought my eyeballs were going, you know, in circles because <laughs> I was so intense on finding the truth. And once I got it, I had to read it again and again and again, because my mind wants to go back to that old teaching that was mm -hmm. wrong. And I had to make sure that I wasn't including that in what I was already knowing was the right way and then I was fixing it to suit myself you know with an old teaching I had to oh that was a terrible thing it was like surgery just taking it and carving it out and getting rid of it 
once I well, got a hold of it. Interest, you, my interest now is because I'm a deliverance and a healing minister mm -hmm. and uh, been using binding and loosing for a long time. So my interest now is to go to uh, spiritual warfare and see how this first started, you know, this first started coming out or as maybe a revelatory, that somebody had a revelation that the uh, you bind and loose, not Satan, but uh, strongholds or or the strong man, how that came about. You know, yes. And you know, here's the thing. I know that not everybody is a Bible scholar. You and I happen to be biblical scholars. We like it. So we dig into it. We want to know the truth because we don't want to teach it wrong. We want to stand before our maker and have him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, and I, I will be the cheese who stands alone from time to time, as you will be, with uh, the truth of the matter. And everybody's looking at us going, yeah, right. You're a fruitcake. I don't care. I think I am. I, I know that once I got the hold of this and I started using it correctly, just mm -hmm. in this last week, in mm -hmm. my study time with other things that I, this curriculum I was writing that God was giving me on certain things uh, that's coming up in the E Crusade, it changed the entire picture. And I could see it, and it was like I had been set free. I had been set free. I had been unbound from the strong man. Amen. I didn't realize that that was a stronghold and that erroneous information that we have been living under all this time binds us up and ties mm -hmm. us up so that we have a misconception and consequently it colors everything. And we have then people coming up to us and saying, well, how about this? And why is that then? Because this doesn't correlate with anything. Right. What does that mean? And you're standing there with a question mark and egg on your face because you can't answer it. You know? Yeah, I think it's important that we relate this to our viewers so that they can get revelation from Absolutely. it. And, and when they get revelation, that's the key that causes a person to change and to want to share it, to, uh, you know? Yeah, you know, I have, I'm, I'm going to uh, grab something really quick here uh, okay. out of my sack of tricks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bag of tricks, whatever you call it. Uh, I want to, there's a prayer that I have, uh, I wrote it so that I could, always do it right um, and uh, that sounds good. it's the one that I do in my healing service so I'm just going to get the healing service out and put your glasses on it makes it go faster and that <laughs> makes it easier because I don't have to get the wrong thing by accident um, oh, healing healing here it is healing service okay now I'm going to run down here to to at the Oh, no, I went to the end. I've got to go backwards. I'm sorry. The, I, I, this. Well, you know, the spiritual warfare says. Okay. here we go. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Father, we okay. thank you for your presence, for the healing power of God that you have given us as a gift and a weapon in our arsenal to use against the enemy. We thank you that you have given us the power to bind and loose. I, I, this is before I got a hold of this. Lord, we praise you, worship you, and give you honor as we bind the devil, the divine health, as we bind the divine health and wholeness of Jesus, the Christ, to our listeners. We give you praise as we lay hands on our listeners and administer the healing power of God to their bodies. And we praise you as we see that healing power coursing through their bodies, healing all sickness and disease that would try to come against them from the enemy. We praise you as we bind the mind of Christ in total restoration of mind, body, and soul to all of those who will believe. And we speak their divine healing into their lives in Jesus' name. All right. I'm going to go back here now, and I'm going to read this because uh, I did when I did this, um, I ran right to this thing and and dug it out <laughs> when I got a hold of this. Okay, Father, we thank you for your presence, for your healing power of God that has given us that you have given us as a gift and a weapon in our arsenal to use against the enemy. We thank you that we are we have that you have given us the power to um, bind and loose. Okay, so that should read. We thank you that. You, you have, well, I can say that. You've given us the power to bind the loose because he did. All right, mm -hmm. Lord, we praise you, worship you, and give you honor as, as we see that what we have already bound, or what we have bound has already been bound, the divine mm -hmm. health and wholeness of Jesus, the Christ, to our listeners. It's already been bound. We have given you, we have to give you praise as we lay hands on our listeners and administer the healing power of God to their bodies. And we praise you as we see that healing power coursing through their bodies, healing all sickness, disease that would try to come against it from the enemy. We praise you as we see that it, 
that the mind of Christ has already been bound, total restoration of mind, body, and soul to all of those who will believe and speak their divine healing into their lives in Jesus' name. See, fortunately, it's right, but I should have said it, and I'm going to start saying it, already been bound, already been loosed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, because if I don't, I'll forget it. And even though what I wrote sounded good, in my mind, I was thinking the old way. Mm -hmm. You know, I was sure. strapping it on them, boy. You know, it's already mm -hmm. been bound to them. Why? Because they're born again. That came with their born again experience. It came in part, part of the power, uh, restoration package, the part of the uh, oh, righteousness package. <laughs> I'll get the word in a minute. Part of the righteousness package. We, if you're born now, if you're not born again, none of this applies to you. The enemy can tie you down, and you won't be unloosed without deliverance. And at that, you're still going to have to come into agreement. You're still going to have to do some changing in the way you think. You're going to have to repent, which means change the way you think. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't repent, and I repented from that, believe me. And I have to go back and change the verbiage on this and rewrite it according to the instruction of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But um, and I'm, I asked the Lord if it was okay if I use the already been, you know, as the prelude to the yeah, rest until of it. You, until until you get I it. get it, you know, yeah, so that I can really practice it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because when I think of it, it's all right. But when I'm in the middle of praying and we're, we're flowing along in the spirit, I can't stumble over that. You know, <laughs> I have to be able to. Okay, because otherwise I go. Now wait a minute. How does that go? You know, and go back and exhort myself, and the people who are listening are going to go, "What? Where did well, that come it from?" It takes repetition to understand. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. And so far, this uh, that the Lord has told me that it's okay for me to do that. So I'm going to. But I just want to share that with you because people have to know that uh, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We stumble. We make mistakes, and we are subject to the garbage that has trickled down to us that we haven't taken the time yet because it hasn't come to our, our uh, awareness to dig it out and fix it. But now when we come to this, like we did last week and we kind of fumbled around with it and we both agreed, this is something we need to delve into so that we all come out with a total awareness. So when I give you the scriptures that I don't read to you, but I, I write them down and write, write the reference down so you can go back and read them. You, I'm giving them to you so that you don't have to. Um, and if you write to me uh, an email, I'll send you the scriptures so that you can go in context with it. Um, and, and I know uh, Pastor Karen will do the same thing. We want you to be aware. We want you to come out with the right, uh, uh, right thinking and right believing because right believing creates right, right living. And... And it sets you free, my friends. It sets you free. So many things, when I got a hold of this, after studying it out, so many little things in my own uh, knowledge, I'll put it that way, uh, it wasn't a spiritual knowledge. It was a, a, an intellectualism kind of knowledge of the word. Changed. It was like it just changed the whole picture and changed it and all the puzzles came together, pieces came together and now the picture wasn't fuzzy and missing pieces. It came together and I went, got it. I see it. But like you say, repetition is a good thing we have to do. So I have to have little helpmates along the way that will tell me that it's already been bound. It's already been loose because that's what heaven's job is, is to back it up. Well, really, heaven's job is that that's the way it was to begin with and we have to comply with heaven. It's not the other way around. Mm -hmm. I've always learned that heaven has to back it up. And I've said this to my listeners and to you even when I was, you know, you're my student. Uh, heaven has to back it up. Yes, they're obligated to back it up, but not really. We're obligated to line up with them. They are obligated because it's already etched in concrete there. It's a, it's a heavenly uh, dictate. It's a, a document that's etched in stone in heaven. And it can't be broken. You see, so we have to line up with that. And we keep messing around until we kind of line up and not quite, and kind of line up and not quite. Finally, we just plug in and whoop de doo everything changes. So the proper interpretation and application of these passages helps us focus on the straightforward approach of Jesus and the apostolic Christianity, whose only charge to the demonic forces was come out. And this is important for today's church. Peace be still, Jesus said, and then come out. Come out, that's right. But he didn't always say peace be still. 
No, he didn't. He, his his favorite things was come out. You know? No, he said one time he said hold thy peace. Yeah, hold thy uh, peace. I didn't mean peace be still. Yeah, hold thy peace. He said hold thy peace. So it's important for today's church to rediscover what demons do not respond to. Uh, that de demons don't respond to our elaborate melodramatic tactics, pronouncements, confessions, and rebukes. They don't. They sit back and look at us like we're nuttier than a fruitcake. You know, we most successfully impact our world when we do what Scripture calls us to do and trust God to do what we can't do, set people free. It's not our job. It's God's job to set people free. And His information, when properly delivered, will do it because it's truth. Now, fourth, when we understand these scriptures, they support what pastors and boards have been doing for hundreds of years. If, but they get carried away, and they start, like you say, if their denomination says do it this way, then they do it that way, and they adhere to that instead of what the Bible says. If well, the, remember the Galatians, um, these were, they uh, said that uh, anybody that came in had to be bound to the law of Moses, and they had to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. and, but Paul didn't come into agreement with that. Mm -hmm. Remember, Paul said, you know, that they were teaching a different gospel. That's right. That's right. And that's what's happened all these many years. That's why there are so many denominations. There wouldn't be denominations. They could they could worship in any platform that they wanted as far as the uh, singing and dancing and praise and worship and all that. They can do anything they want. But when it comes to the Word of God, it has to be according to the Word of God, not according to what um, Joe Blow over here said 1800 years ago that sounded good. You know, I like Smith Wigglesworth and I like some of the things he says in quotes and I like to quote him in my scriptures and in my scripture references and stuff, but I know that he's not speaking scripture, it's what he said. I like John G. Lake, same thing. I'll use it as a commentary uh, inclusion, but not as a biblical one. If it's a scripture, then it'll come out the way God said it, or the way Jesus said it, you know, and not the way that mankind said it. Mm -hmm. Mankind can get a good twist on it or a good grip on it and say it the way that, that helps me remember it. But even then, I want to make sure that biblically it lines up with the Word of God. Because if it doesn't, just because it's clever, doesn't, and it's easy to remember something that's clever. When you it appeals to you and you go, oh, that's easy to remember. Like people that make letters, you know, stand for words so that you can remember. They did that in... A test I had to take anyway. So, <laughs> and so they give you this A B C A, X G J, and you have, these are all words, you know, and so you can remember those letters, and then you sit down and you go, okay, A is this, and <laughs> you know, B is that. So, uh, but it that doesn't make it the gospel. And if the Bible is our only rule for faith and practice, we need to have solid biblical warrant for practices such as vetting applicants for church membership and administering church dis discipline. I don't know how many churches you have attended, but I've been to many. And <laughs> A few. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the churches mm -hmm. that I have gone to, after I've been there, maybe attended, I'll say six services, they want me to immediately shove me into the new member class. They don't have a clue who I am. Nobody's bothered to do anything except shake my hand after the, the service and maybe have a cup of coffee and a cookie, you know, and we all sit around and chat about the, the Word of God or where do you work and what do you do. It's all personal stuff. It has nothing to do with vetting me. Where did you come from? You know, um, I have to say this. My grandmother and grandfather were Baptist, and they were American Baptist. And you couldn't join their church if you didn't have the church you came from send your church records over. They did a thorough vetting. Uh, they were radical. American Baptist is very radical and rigid, and they don't believe in speaking in tongues. They think it's from Satan. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I don't go along with. But my grandparents were deacons in the, that church, you know, and but they had, um, I remember their, their church hierarchy, their government you know, of how it was run, ran smooth, everything was just perfect all the time. It just seemed like they didn't have many upheavals or anything like that because they had, they were doing it off of a biblical platform. When, in fact, they did have somebody come into that church that had a lifestyle that was um, uh, not in keeping with Scripture, and they did the, went to them, one person went, and then the two, and, the, you know, like, just like the word says. Mm -hmm. And they did excommunicate the person from the church. And it was very, uh, uh, well, I mean, it was a gossip mill then. You know, it was like f fodder for the gossips. But instead, that pastor absolutely from that pulpit forbid them to talk 
amongst themselves about that person leaving the church. Mm -hmm. And the, he monitored it with his it deacons have, and whatnot. It would have been gossip. Yeah, probably. and he was, but he was rigid in trying to keep them lined up with those kinds of things that we know that are are uh, not good. <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to do. So anyway, and of course they're Ten Commandment people, so they were still trying to fulfill the law. But anyway, that's beside the point. But you know what? Uh, I think it's a blessing to have the teachings of Jesus to guide us, our thoughts and our actions, rather than tradition and personal preferences and popular practices. And especially when I got a hold of this, and I'm, uh, because this is uh, all I have for you today, which is a lot, I think. Which it's is, to yeah, it's, it's been a lot. I mean, I'm not sure that yeah. I, it's a lot that I, I'm going to have to go back and, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, I thought, um, from Ephesians that we bind principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, and then we lose people from the, uh, any strong man or any spiritual bondage. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is my training from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. It was as, mine, uh, too. It was mine, too. Yeah. It's not it. Yeah. However, if we, in, in correlation to forgiveness, if we don't forgive, we have that, we keep that person bound. So, we, there, when we delve into this again next week and maybe even the week after as we break break this down to a gnat swing so everybody will get it we're going to mm -hmm. see even we will see the the our mistakes of uh, misinterpretation and that kind of thing uh, th then and it'll help us it will help us these are tools binding and loosing are tools we have been given the power by God to the bind authority. and loose mm -hmm. that's a, the authority to do it but it has to be the same things that is already bound in heaven, already heaven. already mm -hmm. loosed in heaven, see? Mm -hmm. So that means we have the power to line up with what's bound already and what's loosed already. What's given permission to do and what's not given permission to do. And the only way we're going to know that is the Holy is our Holy Spirit. Well, our covenant covers it. Our, covenant. our blood covenant covers it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so, uh, but we'll get it. I mean, there's a whole lot, and I'm still working on it. <laughs> in, in I'm still parts. working on it. So <laughs> if anybody has anything they'd like to contribute to help us with our Amen. Here, <laughs> Amen. To help us with our revelation. Yes. Write uh, something. And you can also, during our program, you can also message us. As you're listening, if you have some comments or questions or whatever you want to add to what we're saying and, and bring something, a new, a new subject in, even if it's a rabbit trail, it's okay. Uh, do it because it'll pop up on on our our uh, uh, dashboard, and I can click into it, read the question, and then we can discuss it. And we can get our Bibles out and dig it out right here. It doesn't matter. We're not in a hurry, you know. Right. <laughs> we just want right. to get it right. So right now, though, if you desire to come into, unless you're not finished, Pastor Karen, did you no, have more? No. Okay. <laughs> I had a lot to absorb. If you desire to come into and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, if you desire to be in Christ and avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom and power, you have to give your life to him. And it's very simple. It's pain-free. And in just a moment, we're going to give you that opportunity.
heaven <laughs> that you have the opportunity for to receive Jesus Christ and to receive his salvation for you today Lord, for you today family and so we want to um, have you pray this prayer along with us today in order to be able to receive the Lord as your Savior say this after me Jesus I believe that you are the son of the living God you were born, you came in the flesh to atone for my sins and all my sickness and disease on the cross. And you were raised from the dead after three days. Father, I come to you today and I repent of my sins now. And I ask you to forgive me of all of them, all past, present, and future sin. sin. Father, I ask you to come into my heart today. I want to make you my Lord and Savior now and forever. I thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy, and your compassion for me. I believe that once I was lost, but now I am found, and I choose to serve you all the days of my life. Family, if you pray that prayer, we welcome you into the family of God. We would love to disciple you. Uh, we hope that these programs that you're listening to uh, disciple you each and every week. And uh, feel free, we're going to give you our information at the end of this broadcast, and please feel free to contact us. And welcome to the family of God. Amen. Amen.
interesting things that we offer with this program um, is Old Testament history on Holy Communion. And Pastor Karen has a special anointing for that. And so, Pastor Karen, will you share that with us? Sure. Excuse me. Over 3,500 years ago, the Hebrew people were slaves to the Egyptians. We all know that. And we know that the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, was unwilling to release the Hebrews and allow them to return to Israel. So God decided to send 10 plagues against the Egyptians. And the 10th plague resulted in the death angel moving from house to house, taking the lives of the firstborn, both men and beast, of the Egyptians. But the Hebrews were, um, were not sacrificed. The Hebrew children were not, were not, their lives were not taken. Hallelujah. God told the Hebrews at this time, to, when the 10th plague and the death angel were, was coming for them, he told them to sacrifice a lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their houses. So in Exodus 12, 13, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you. So thus the Hebrew families were protected from both sickness and death as a result of the blood, the blood and the body of the lamb. So we see that the appointed festival of Passover became the forerunner of the Lord's Supper, where the Lord Jesus himself becomes the sacrificial lamb and his blood was shed on the cross for not only our sins, but also for our complete protection, healing, salvation, and deliverance. So in fact, we understand that Jesus was having Passover with his disciples when he instituted the Last Supper with the New Covenant, 
whereby no longer would, they, would the Hebrews emphasize deliverance from Egypt, but instead each time that they took the cup of wine and unleavened bread, they would celebrate deliverance from sin and the promise of eternal life. You see, the blood of the Lamb in Egypt was a foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus, who was identified as the Lamb of God by John the Baptist in John 1, verse 29, where John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the historical application of Passover is that we see its prophetic fulfillment in Christ, who as God's final perfect Lamb died during Passover. Communion denotes a sharing of the elements and reminds us not only of our redemption through Christ, but also our future inheritance with Christ in the kingdom of God. Matthew 26, verse 29 says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day that I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Now let's look at the elements, the unleavened bread and the wine or the juice. The Jewish unleavened bread used during Passover was called the bread of affliction because of the Hebrew slavery in Egypt. However, with the new covenant in Jesus, it's called the bread of life. You see, Jesus said in John 6, I tell you for certain that Moses was not the one who gave you the bread from heaven. And the bread that God gives is the one who came down from heaven to give life to the world. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, and if any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. See, your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. So family, we're not only proclaiming the Lord's death, as Jesus taught us to do, to proclaim his death through these elements, but we're also receiving a new impartation of life through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and in this communion service today. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the wonderful things that we receive from taking Holy Communion is healing of our bodies and our minds. And we have to prepare before taking Holy Communion. And in that preparation, I want you to understand something about our use of the elements of the covenant. Jesus and his disciples had bread and wine on the table when they shared the Last Supper. And the meal itself had come to an end. You know, there was some stuff, just food stuff still left on the table. Some bread, some wine. And these items were all familiar to them. Because those particular items were used to draw the picture that Jesus wanted them to see, we use the same items. However, remember that it doesn't matter what food items you're using. Use what you have available to you. It's perfectly acceptable. And the reason is this, because we pray over the items, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. So what I want you to see in this is that what you need to do is believe that they become that body and blood. Now the Word of God tells us that the first thing we must do is discern the body of Christ. We do that by acknowledging that the bread or whatever food item you're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus, His supernatural healing and wholeness. His, his, it, that because His body and His blood are, uh, uh, have supernaturally become part of you, you're now bone of His bone and, and of Jesus' bones and, and uh, flesh of His flesh because you're in Christ that you are now filled with his perfection and power, completely healed, healed and completely made whole, completely restored to divine health and wholeness. And you could think of it as medicine, a pill that's going with the Shekinah glory of God. That medicine, every time you take it, is healing you as it travels down through your mouth and down into your body. And as it goes, it's pushing out all the darkness, which is sickness and disease, and it's doing it from the inside out. Visualize the condition you're plagued with, that sickness or disease being on Jesus' body. Put whatever your ailments are on him. Use your imagination. You're not giving him something he doesn't want. Remember, he already took it at the cross. So the enemy's trying to trick you. He's trying to trick you into taking it by deceiving you into thinking you've got it through lying symptoms. But since Jesus took it already at the cross, you are made whole and completely healed at the cross. So put that lying symptom back on Jesus, right in the same place on him you've been afflicted. In other words, see yourself without the problem. See yourself with the solution and rehearse the solution. <laughs> this is called spiritual visualization. You know, it's vital you understand it and put it into practice. If you've been diagnosed with a problem and you're being treated by a doctor, then continue your treatment and medications. But add to it your faith 
and your taking of Holy Communion for healing and restoration. Remember, too, that we believe in doctors. Don't just try to uh, mental ascent your way away through the situation. See, do uh, see a doctor and get a name for what's plaguing you. Why? Because everything with a name has to bow to the name of Jesus. Now, the next thing we do in preparation is discern the blood of Christ. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future, as restoration of the blessing to your life, the power and the authority of God in full operation in your life, as receiving God's provision and protection, as receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption and that you've even been included in it, that you've been given eternal life, life everlasting, and now you no longer live under the law, you live under his grace. Now, Lift up the elements of the covenant. These are the items that I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. Lift them up before the Lord as I pray. <clears throat> Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this food item becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we become healed and made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we are continually washed in the waterfall of his precious blood and renewed within as we continually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship. It's actually a partnership with Christ, and partaking of one bread creates a partnership between the members, the disciples, as well. It merges us all into one body, known as the church. Now, the Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. We are supposed to continually take the bread, give thanks, and break it and eat it, then take the cup, give thanks, and drink it, all in the remembrance of Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. Now, the Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often. However, Paul doesn't give us instruction as to the frequency of the Lord's Supper and how it's to be celebrated and how often. He does imply, though, that it's to be done with frequency so that a partaking of the Lord's Supper recalls to our mind continually our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. Do it as often as you want to and need to. Remember, too, that you don't need a priest, nor do you need a minister or pastor to administer Holy Communion to you. We are born-again believers, and as members of the royal as born-again believers, we're members of the royal priesthood. Therefore, we've been given the authority and right by God to administer Holy Communion to ourselves and others. Now, as we're instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you that this item of food has become the bread of life and has become the healing body of our Lord Jesus the Christ. The body of our Lord Jesus the Christ broken for you so that every cell, every tissue, every organ and bone, all systems, blood vascular, neurological, cardiovascular, lymphatic, muscular, skeletal, all systems are totally aligned with God's word and his will, that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to divine health and wholeness. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that this beverage has become the precious saving blood, cleansing and saving blood of our Lord Jesus, the Savior, and the Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross for the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future, and for the restoration of the empowerment of God, the blessing in your life, and the gift of righteousness. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. You know, the Lord's Supper is a feast. It's a feast in union with the believers and the living Savior, whereby... We spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits, and we are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life, and for that we are eternally grateful. Pastor Karen, would you close this blessing, please? Yes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. 
Did you receive this today? We pray that you did. If you need further assistance with understanding the messages, we'll understand why. <laughs> we need further assistance. <laughs> yes. After today, we need further assistance. So please contact us. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Karen, will you give us your contact information, please? <laughs> sure. Uh, if you want to private message me, uh, contact me on my email, honoringhands at AOL.com. Uh, I've been talking about some revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, lately, you can go to Spreaker.com under uh, Refuge of Hope Healing and Prayer Room. Uh, Refuge of Hope is my uh, ministry. Uh, my website is with Dr. Stephanie at themasterstouch.org. And uh, I like to be. Uh, I'd like you to go to Refuge of Hope, and and uh, I'm a crisis counselor uh, through Skype, so you can reach me under Karen Weitzman, K A R E N W E I T Z M A N, um, or you can reach me on Refuge of Hope on Facebook, or under Karen Weitzman, uh, you can review some of my messages there. On, on my timeline, and I look forward to speaking to you. I've been counseling people who have been depressed and suicidal. So um, I, if you know of someone, please, uh, I've been having some good success, and please feel free to have them contact me through Skype. Um, so I look forward to speaking with you. Okay. You can reach me at masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net, poet at cox.net, P-O-E-T at cox.net, or M-T-H-S prayer at cox.net. That's the letter M, the letter T, the letter H, the letter S, and the word prayer at cox.net. Thank you for joining us. Living the Word is brought to you every Monday at 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, which is 1 p.m. Uh, somewhere else. <laughs> I'm going to take that out of there <laughs> in Colorado. <laughs> Remember, Proverbs 4, verse 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all of your getting, get understanding. And my friends, that is exactly what we're doing here, seeking and gaining God's wisdom from his word. Now, before um, I close today's program, I want to tell you about our upcoming e-crusade. 2016. You're cordially invited to attend our e-crusade. We have scheduled the crusade to commence August 15th at 8 a.m. Pacific Time through August 19th at 4 p.m. Pacific Time. Uh, actually, I'm generalizing. What we're going to do is daily we go from 8 to 4 at, for five days, <laughs> so, which is a Monday through Friday. We'll bring you continual daily broadcasts from the Word of God on this year's theme, Grace, Wisdom, and Mercy, and how they connect and impact uh, uh, the, but the impact that they have on us believers. Now, we have scheduled a variety of very anointed doctors, pastors, and ministers from all over the globe to share the Word of God and all of its nuances on our subject. You won't want to miss any of it. You know, this crusade is going to be marvelous. We are archiving our daily broadcasts on Spreaker.com, YouTube.com, Twitter. You can uh, cl click on Twitter, and it'll give you the link, and you can go on that and hear it. Googleplus.com, and on our website, themasterstouch.org. So, for your edification and ed education, there'll be everywhere for you. We're just going to saturate you in it. Join us August 15th through the 19th daily, and you can go to Spreaker.com, enter dr.stef, like Frank, E-N-I, then the word E-Crusade, and it's a small E, it's all lowercase anyway, and the word Crusade, but it's E-Crusade is one word, and you should be able to log in that way. And if not, I'll find out. <laughs> <I'll fix it. laughs> okay. We look forward to uh, your joining us. And uh, actually, we're just really looking forward to this. It's been a lot of work, and we're just trying to put all this into one lump is really going to be exciting. It's going to be some really good, good stuff. So remember, Living the Word is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. And we leave you with this reminder. First John chapter 4, verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. So right now, however Jesus is, perfect, prosperous, abundant, full of divine health and wholeness, that's exactly how you are too. So meditate on that scripture until you become it, my friends. God bless you. Bye-bye.